you've never been here. Flywheel is an all-volunteer run, nonprofit community art space. We do mostly music events, but we also do community events like this, film screenings, art events, and the like. And because we're all volunteer, nonprofit, we pretty much survive on donations uh, by individuals and at, at events we do. So if you haven't, we have a small can out front, whatever you can donate to keep the space going. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. So I'll turn it over to you all for this great event. Thank you, Jeremy. So right. you, you know, we sort of planned this a couple of months ago and really planned this because there was a lot of concern about rising hate crimes and bias related incidents both during the election cycle and since the election. As you're all aware, um, I think one month uh, after the election, Southern Poverty Law Center documented almost 1,100 hate crimes and bias related incidents across the country. And interestingly, Massachusetts was number four in the list of states that were most affected. Wow. So we thought that this would be an event where we could learn about the resurgence of these hate groups, violent extremist groups, what are their operating strategies, how do they recruit, and what effective strategies can we employ to keep young, at-risk youth away from such organizations. As far as my story goes, um, you know, I, in 1987 when I was 14 years old, I was a pretty normal teenager. You know, I like to chase girls, I like to play baseball, uh, but I also was very insecure and had low self-esteem. Um, you know, just like every other teenager, there were three very fundamental needs that I was searching for. Uh, an identity, a community, and a sense of purpose. Uh, and those are fundamental needs that I think everybody in this room has, has gone through probably during their most vulnerable times. Uh, as a young person is who am I, you know, where do I belong, and, and how do I affect the world or leave my mark or change the world. Uh, and that's something that we all go through. Unfortunately for me, um, even though I was raised uh, by very loving parents in a very good home environment, my parents were Italian immigrants who came to the United States in the mid-1960s and had to work very, very hard uh, to make it. So when they came, uh, they opened a small beauty shop, and that kept them away from home seven days a week, 14 hours a day. So while I was surrounded with love and I wasn't raised with racism, in fact, it was the opposite, because they were the victims of prejudice when they came to this country, um, I really felt abandoned by them. I didn't understand at that age why my parents weren't there for my school events or why they weren't home when I came home from school or why when I had a baseball game, you know, my parents were the only ones that weren't there. I didn't quite understand that, so I felt uh, very abandoned by them. And I went in search of this, this identity and this community, this sense of family elsewhere. So one day, uh, when I was standing in an alley at 14 years old and I was smoking a joint, uh, a man drove his car up that alley and he screeched to a halt just a few inches away from me. And when he got out of the car, he had a shaved head and he was wearing boots and he walked over to me and he grabbed that joint from my mouth and he said, don't you know that that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile? I was 14, I didn't really know what a communist was, uh, <laughs> except for her, you know, my favorite movie, Rocky, with the bad guy and stuff. And uh, I don't think I knew, if I'd met a Jewish person, I didn't know it, and uh, I hardly knew what the word docile meant. Um, but I was struck with this man's charisma, he was twice my age, and I had lived a very powerless existence. Uh, and he promised me one thing, and it was very simple. It had nothing to do with ideology, it had nothing to do with racism. It had to do with acceptance. And at 14 years old, I was brought in uh, to America's first neo-Nazi skinhead gang by the man who was America's first neo-Nazi skinhead who happened to live right across the street from where I lived. So, you know, to some degree, I was a victim of, of circumstance. Uh, but I was also searching for something, and at a vulnerable age, he understood very well how to play to those vulnerabilities. The same way that many people today who uh, are leaders within this ideology know how to pinpoint, pinpoint um, marginalized young people, maybe not even young people so much anymore these days, but just marginalized people 
who are looking for an easy solution for their problems. Because what the main crux of the movement is, or what a hateful ideology is about, is about blaming somebody else for the problems that, you exist, in your, that exist in your life without forcing you to really reflect internally about whether you are party to that or whether you cause them or not. It's an us against them kind of mentality. So, you know, I would say, just to kind of sum up, I was a normal kid who was looking for normal teenage things like identity and community and purpose. Uh, and suddenly somebody intercepted me when they knew that that's what I was looking for and didn't have a positive outlet for it. And they brought me in under the promise of paradise. They said, come with me and all your problems will go away. They gave me somebody else to blame. And that's essentially how I started out. And I stayed in for eight years until I was 22 years old, so from 1987 to 1995, roughly. So um, once you were sort of sucked into this group, um, you know, what did you, how did you interact with other members of the group? And, you know, did you talk about it when you heard them and, you know, those who were completely immersed in the ideology? Were they talking about um, white identity and how it was under threat? And what did you think about that? Yeah, you know, it went from, a, it started out as a very soft, benign pitch, uh, you know, where I, I was told I should be proud of who I was. Uh, you know, proud of my European heritage and, and, and proud of the accomplishments that white culture has brought to the world. Uh, that's how I was brought in. And I, you know, I was pretty proud of being Italian. That's really kind of all I knew. So I related to that message. Um, I didn't understand when the conversation started to go into, well, you know, the immigrants are coming to take away your jobs. And I thought, well, my parents are immigrants and they've never taken anybody's job. They started their own business. <laughs> Uh, so that didn't really relate to that at first, and uh, I didn't really relate to the to the fact that they're you know they were blaming African Americans for coming into our neighborhood to cause crime, or Latinos who were supposedly coming into our neighborhoods to rape women and sell drugs, or uh, you know the Jewish people who controlled the media and the finance system. I was 14 years old. I didn't see any of this. I didn't you know it didn't happen, but I believed it. Uh, because I thought these people were smarter, uh, because more than anything else, I wanted to fit in and matter um, above anything else. And I can tell you this because I've, I've talked to thousands, at least a thousand people who are both members of extremist groups and former members, and when I ask them, why did you join? Because I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Almost to one, every single one of them told me I joined because I just wanted to belong to something. Uh, and the ideology comes later. I mean, nobody's born racist. I certainly wasn't. It was something that I learned, and I learned it because of the other reasons. I wanted to fit in. I wanted a family. I wanted to be respected, and I and I wanted to change the world. And they kind of bastardized my altruistic sense of wanting to make a, an impact on the world, and and shifted it towards. Uh, you know, saving the white race, that became my mission because we were told that diversity was a code word for white genocide. And so what was that point when it, you know, you had sort of rose uh, through the ranks in this group um, and when did it turn into violence? When and how gradual was that process in which you felt like now I can actually uh, mm -hmm. create acts of violence? It was relatively quick, I'd say, and more, not because the violence is something that attracted me, but because it was something that you almost needed to do to, to be accepted. Um, but then certainly, I mean, I take full accountability, it was something that I became intoxicated with that I fully did at, you know, at my own volition, um, because it became something that kept me relevant in this movement, and not only did it keep me relevant, but it propelled me into positions of power. Uh, but I also, uh, you know, they, the older people set an example. So two years after I joined at 16 years old, the man who recruited me, who was America's first neo-Nazi skinhead leader, uh, went to prison for a series of violent hate crimes. Uh, one of the first hate crimes in the history of our country. Uh, and uh, one of those was, um, they saw a fellow skinhead girl hanging out at a bus stop with a black man. And uh, they went later to her apartment and they beat her, and they pistol whipped her, and uh, before they left, 
they painted a swastika on her wall with her own blood. Yeah. And for that, uh, thankfully, they were arrested. But what that also did for me was now put me in a position where there was a void of leadership. And because now I had been around for two years, and because I had learned the, the propaganda methods, and I'd learned how to recruit, and I'd learned the rhetoric, uh, everybody who was recruited after me, which was basically everybody who was left, looked to me as their leader. And now, for the first time in my life, I wasn't just this marginalized kid who was bullied growing up, uh, or who didn't matter, or who was made fun of because my parents didn't speak perfect English. Now I, I had kind of stepped into a different level. I was a leader and I was respected and I was feared. And the bullies who picked on me now would cross the street when they saw me coming and then later I would recruit them. Um, you know, so it kind of did a complete 180 switch and all of a sudden I was intoxicated with this level of false power and false respect uh, that just kept fueling me to, to do more and more and more and uh, you know it really was a, a chase of power because for all, my whole life I had never really experienced that and now that I had it I wasn't willing to let it go and I even did things, first of all I always questioned my ideology, there was always something in the back of my mind because of the way I was raised that allowed me to question what I was doing. Um, and I'm, I'm really, really glad that that existed because that really stopped me from, uh, from doing some things that I know I would have regretted more than the things that I did that I do regret. Um, and I credit my parents for that. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have wanted to associate with them during that time, but what they taught me at a young age still lived inside of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I committed those acts of violence because I was angry and being a part of that movement and, and, and having that ideology gave me a license, I felt like, to, to commit violence. Uh, I also feel like I acted out and hated other people, not because I hated other people, but because I hated myself. I was trying to remove the pain that I was feeling, the loneliness, and projecting that onto other people so that I wouldn't have to feel it anymore. I was transferring that. So you mentioned your parents. Um, looking back at your processes of radicalization, um, what role do you think um, either your extended family, your parents, your educators, the, the schools that you were in, local community leaders, what role could they have played to keep you off of that path to begin with or veer you away from it? A lot. <laughs> they could have done a lot. Uh, we didn't have, you know, growing up in Blue Island, we were a pretty lower middle class neighborhood, very, you know, blue collar. Um, there weren't a lot of opportunities for young people, let alone adults. Um, and what I'll say to that is, you know, looking back now and, and doing the work that I do to help pull people out of hate groups for the last at least 15 years. Um, I can say that young people want to be heard. They don't want to be talked to. You know, they're smarter than we give them credit for. They're very ambitious. And they may not have the experience that adults have, uh, but they really need to be, they need to have their passions amplified at a very, very young age. As adults, we've been there. We know how hard it is to be a teenager. We know how hard it is to feel lonely or picked on or, or how hard it is to, to work to fit in. and. You know, I think our job now, having learned those lessons, is we need to do everything we can to support young people in positive ways. That should be our mission. Uh, we should all be teachers. We should all be guides. And we should all be platforms uh, and launch pads for the success of our young people. Because if somebody were to come to me at 14 years old and said, hey, you're a pretty good artist, or geez, you're pretty good at baseball, or you know, uh, you know, you may be a good actor or whatever. I probably would have gone that way because I was really screaming for somebody to just pay attention for me. And the person who heard me is the one who kind of took me under his wing. Um, you know, I never had teachers who said, uh, "I don't agree with what you're saying. Let's sit down and talk." I had teachers that suspended me and put me in detention and expelled me and. Uh, I never had somebody pull me aside and say, hey, what you're doing is horrible, but I get it. I get why you're doing it, and it's not because of why you think you're doing it. How can I help you? How can I enable you or empower you to do something that you love instead of you know, just filling your life with all this hate so you get the attention that you're seeking in negative ways? 
So, you know, I wouldn't have spoken to a police officer or a teacher or a counselor or a therapist or even a parent in those days because everybody was my adversary. Had somebody stepped in and said, you know, I, I don't like what you're doing, but I get it. Let's, let's find something that you're passionate about and what can I do to help you? I think most young people would, would really appreciate that because it seems that young people are often at odds with adults. And you have to understand, I mean, these young people, for the first 18 years of their lives, they live under a dictatorship, right? It's true. Parents, you tell them where to go, when they need to come home, who they can hang around with. At a young age, they're ready to be independent. They're ready to rebel and, and, and create that identity. We have to be careful because if we don't allow them to create a positive narrative for themselves and enable them to do that, somebody will come along and give them a narrative to adhere to. It will happen because kids are looking and there are people who are very interested in providing that narrative that suits their own selfish needs. So I think we really need to embrace young people, uh, listen to them, uh, and then empower their passions. My daughter does call me a dictator most of the time. <laughs> so something to Benevolent that. Dictator. <laughs> That's what I think I am. But so, um, you know, so how and when did you actually decide to leave the movement? And was it a gradual process or was it one pivotal transformative experience that got you to sort of move away? Yeah, you know, it was not an overnight thing. I didn't go to sleep one night, you know reciting Hitler speeches and wake up the next morning and saying, I love everybody. Um, it, was a, it was an eight year process. Thank you. Um, it, was a, it was an eight year process with a series of events. Uh, what it came down to is I hated people I'd never met. I didn't even know the objects of my hate. I didn't have meaningful conversations with African Americans or Jewish people or Muslims or gay people or anybody that was different than me. It just, it just didn't happen. But at an age, around 19 years old, I opened a record store um, because I wanted to sell, of course, I wanted to sell white power music, that's all I knew. And I did, and I sold a lot of it. Uh, as a matter of fact, it became 75% of my gross revenue at my small record shop. This was before the internet, so people were driving from all over. But what also happened was, because I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I started to sell other music, like punk rock and hip hop and heavy metal. And, and when the customers would come in to buy that music, at first, I was very standoffish. Uh, but the customers were black and gay and Jewish and, and Asian and you name it. The more they kept coming back, the more the conversations turned away from, you know, do you have this in stock, to more personal conversations. And for the first time in my life, uh, I started to have really meaningful interactions with the people who I thought I hated. And for the first time in my life, I began to humanize them. And when the black teenager would come in and I could tell he was sad and then he would open up and tell me it was because his mother had passed from cancer, I knew that I felt the same pain that he did when my mother was diagnosed with cancer. Or when I saw the gay couple who clearly loved their son, I knew that they loved their son the same way that I loved my son. So suddenly I started to become very confused because the reality that was living in my head didn't match the reality that I was feeling with my heart. And uh, I became very close to these people and essentially receiving compassion from the people that I least deserved it from, when I least deserved it, was what helped me make that transformation. And it was those things happening over and over and over. You know, and I can tell you most of the people that I work with who you know, hate Muslims or hate black people or hate Jewish people, they've never met them. They don't know, they don't, they've never had an interaction with them. So it's easy to hate somebody you don't know because it's easy to blame somebody. It's hard to love because you risk losing something when you love something. But it is also, it's also much more rewarding and it, it helps you humanize and understand yourself and the world around us and helps us realize we need each other to fix this broken world. And the more that we're polarized and the more that we're divided, the more our world is broken. So then you went on and um uh, founded, co-founded Life After Hate. So could you tell us a little bit more about what led you to that and the kind of work that you do and who's involved? 
Sure. So when I left the movement in uh, 1995, uh, I tried to outrun it. Uh, at the same time I left uh, the movement, I closed my record store because I came, became too embarrassed to sell the white power music. And of course, because it was so much in my sales, I had to close the store. Um, so I lost my livelihood. Uh, my wife and my children left me uh, because they weren't a part of the movement. I hadn't left quickly enough. Um, I didn't have a great relationship with my parents uh, and I lost my family when I left the movement. Uh, so I really went through a period of five years where I was suffering a major depression where almost every morning I woke up and I considered taking my own life because I, even though I had started to treat other people with respect, I was miserable. But that was because I was outrunning who I was. I'd move, I wore long sleeves, I'd grow my hair out, uh, and I wouldn't talk about it. And then one day, uh, a friend, one of the only friends that I had came up to me and she said, if you don't do something with your life, you're gonna die and I don't wanna lose you. And I said, okay, well, what do you suggest? And she said, well, there's this company I work for, it's a small company, maybe you heard of them, they're called IBM. <laughs> <laughs> And she said, you should apply there for a job. They're looking you know, for uh, you know, a, a contract or temp worker. And I said, okay, uh, but let me tell you something. Uh, I didn't go to university. I got kicked out of five high schools. I'm a former neo-Nazi. And uh, by the way, I don't own a computer or know how to use a computer. <laughs> what could they possibly see in me? And she said, oh, just tell them you're good with people. I was like, <laughs> So, so I did it. I told them I was good with people, and, and uh, I wrote my first, you know, resume, and I lied on my first resume, and, uh, and I got the job. And of all the places, literally millions of, of customers that IBM has, where did they put me? But my old high school that I got kicked out of twice to install the new computers for the school. Yeah. I was terrified. Now, this was five years after I'd left the movement, but I knew, like, I caused hell there. So they were going to recognize me within the first five minutes and I was going to lose this first meaningful thing that happened to me. And uh, of course, you know, it's fate or karma or kismet or God's will or whatever it is that you believe in would have it. In the first five minutes on my first day at work, who walks by me but the black security guard I'd gotten in a fist fight with that got me kicked out for the second time. And I was terrified. I was a grown man, and I was like sweating, and I couldn't like think of words to say. And I, you know, I, it was terrible. But I decided I had to do something, and I chased this man to the into the parking lot. Probably not a good choice. <laughs> uh, but I, but I followed him to the parking lot, and I tapped him on the shoulder. And and uh, when he turned around, this this beautiful, jolly black man who always had this great smile turned around, and he recognized me. And he was afraid, and he took a step back. Um, and all I could think to do at that moment was just extend my hand and say, "I'm sorry." And uh, he shook my hand, and we talked, and we you know embraced, and we may have cried just a little bit. It was a long time ago. <laughs>